I do one really quick check to see if it's better without the earphones. Um, sure, let me just pause the recording really quickly. Hang on a second. Um, I imagine the earphones are better. Are they on now? They're on now, yeah. Yeah, it's slightly better. Okay, cool. Um, sorry about that, we recorded that part. Oh, that's okay, don't worry. I'm gonna um, share my screen if you can let people in. One second. Okay, ready, steady. everyone we're just waiting a few more minutes to let some other people into the room but welcome great um just give it a few seconds yeah it seems like we're all here now um, good evening, everyone. My name is Louisa Uliet, and I'm curator of talks and events at the Photographer's Gallery. Thank you for joining us. It is evening here in London and getting quite dark now. We're really delighted to be here with Mark Seeley and Karen McQuaid, curators of the newly opened Sunil Gupta, From Here to Eternity, a retrospective of the work of the acclaimed artist. This show brings together 16 different bodies of work from a practice stemming across 40 plus years into an exhibition that is just as ambitious and complex as the artist himself. Tonight, Mark and Karen will take us through the exhibition, moving more deeply into specific ideas they had around the, the chronological hang, the conceptualization of the accompanying publication, which I happen to have here now, and then their approach to some of the themes evident in Sunil's work, like text and language, representation, and the politics of health. Uh, before we move into the format, I just want to give you some background on our speakers today. So Mark Seeley is Director of Autograph, an independent photography organization which champions work investigating issues around cultural identity, race, representation, and human rights. He has curated several major exhibitions and his publications include Different uh, with Professor Stuart Hall and most recently Decolonize the, ca the Camera, Photography in Racial Times which actually I should have pulled from my bookshelf, but I haven't done that. Uh, Karen McQuaid is Senior Curator at the Photographer's Gallery. In addition to this current retrospective of Sunil's work, she also curated last year's Shot in Soho at the Gallery, and is also working on a forthcoming exhibition of Helen Kamek, which will feature a new commission. This will hopefully take place later next year. After their presentation and discussion, we will move to questions and comments from you using either the chat feature here or the Zoom function that allows you to raise your hand electronically, and then we will unmute you so you can pose your comments and questions directly to Mark and Karen. This event should last roughly one hour. Please note we are recording this, so if you do not wish to be featured, please turn off your camera. We are approaching this event in the same way we do all of our public programs, which is with the aim of creating a form of trust and mutual respect, so please keep that in mind. I hope this, today's discussion inspires you, and we look forward to seeing you again here during some of our other planned online activity and even more hopefully in the gallery where you can visit Sunil's show now. So thank you again for joining us and now to Mark Seeley and Karen McWaid. Thank you. Okay. Hi everyone. Welcome. Um, welcome Mark. Um, I might just, if everyone doesn't mind, just give a little initial framework for how the show came about um, and the different institutions involved. Um, so um, Ryerson University Gallery in um, Canada the Photographer's Gallery and Autograph AVP have worked together before very successfully. So in 2015, um, Mark uh, curated Human Rights, Human Wrongs, which we hosted at the gallery. Um, so we entered into this as three organizations with pre-existing trust, which was actually, well, really, we were quite grateful for because this was an exhibition that was planned as lockdowns and world events were changing at quite a rapid race, uh, rate of change. 
Um, I worked closely with my colleague Anna Dannemann on this, um, who I'm very grateful for. And we've had, again, a lot of kind of trust and faith from Sunil's galleries, uh, Vadahera Gallery, Hale's Gallery and Bulgar Gallery. Um, and of course, Sunil himself um, worked incredibly hard on this. He printed a lot of the show for us. Um, so just to get those initial kind of thank yous out of the way, um, and also thank you to Bagri Foundation and Durjoy Foundation for support along the way. Um, so yeah, very much a warm thank you to Mark and um, our colleagues at all of those organizations for their kind of trust and support. Um, the format really is we might, I might take you through a really quick whistle stop tour of the show itself. Um, and then Mark and I maybe can have uh, a more meaty conversation once we've run through that uh, to give you all a sense for those of you who mightn't be able to visit, give you a sense of the show itself. So I might just start to share my screen if that's all right. And let me know if that's working. Let me bring this to uh, full screen. Uh, yeah, how's that look? Um, it's a two floor, floor retrospective. Um, Sunil has a wonderful kind of history with our organization, which we're really kind of pleased about. I, I, liked, to, I liked to think as we were planning this show that he had he kind of grew up as an artist in a way alongside us maturing as an organization. So the body politic in 1987, which he was included in, new British color photography in 1980, he curated a show called The Economy of Signs in 1990. So our history and uh, Sunil's history have crisscrossed in lots of lovely ways. So to have this retrospective as we approach our 50th um, feels, feels very uh, fitting. Um, so on the fifth floor of the show, we have works from about 1970 to the 90s. And just I'll just concentrate on two projects on each floor so that we can really whiz through this and get to some meatier stuff. Um, on, so Sunil, as a practitioner, had moved from um, New Delhi with his family to Montreal and had um, Friends and Lovers, which is the first, the first work that you see here was really when he started using a camera. He had moved to Montreal, he was extending his, his, his family was growing so that it's a series that includes um, some very sweet domestic photographs of his family who had just emigrated and that sort of theme of emigration is important in his work, emigration and family and uh, both made family, created family of the, his extended gay family that he was kind of coming to know at that time as he was coming out um, he was also already working um, within kind of a newspaper advocacy within a, a kind of a student newspaper context. So this was that first project really is him kind of getting used to using the camera. Um, and then by the time we get to Christopher Street, so Sunil moved from Montreal to New York. Um, and this piece is from 1976. And he says he talks about really landing in a kind of a specific cultural moment um, in New York. So after the Stonewall riots, which happened in 69, but before the AIDS crisis really kind of ripped up the gay community. Um, so a real moment of confidence. Um, so he took to the street um, as an active participant, maybe one might say in kind of cruising, you know, there's a lot of sort of joy and desire in this project. It's a project where he is uh, kind of fancying, watching, looking, you know, that idea, um, that idea of him being an active, um, there's a lot of desire there, one might say. So um, this has recently been published as a very lovely book with Stanley Barker. Um, so that idea of kind of prideful display is I think very important in Sunil's work. And this is a great early example. And um, I also, also like to think when looking at them that he was very young when he made this, he was in his early twenties. Um, so he's in New York at a moment uh, of, as, it, as I've said, where this kind of cultural moment is really happening. And there is a very much a sense of being out and proud, which was very new and exciting to him. It's also a very crucial moment for New York for photography. He enrolled in the new school um, and was taught by Lisette Modell, who was a very, you know, very celebrated street photographer who had taught Diane Arbus. Um, so this idea of him kind of, you know, really getting used to his camera and going out into the street and using it in this way. And um, there's about 60 photographs in the series. And this is one of the first times, I believe, I think it's the first time that all 60 have been shown together. And when Mark and Anna and Sunil and I were really talking about the display of the show, this idea that all 60 would be together and um, in the one space 
the idea that it might actually be, there might even be a sense of overwhelm when you see them was, so if you just see to the right there, um, it's the entire 60 are installed in one long line. So that sense of kind of, yeah, the, the, the kind of the immense, the, the, the depth and, and that sort of overwhelm of, of numbers in a way, uh, as, as I think Sunil has said in the past, too many men, too little time. So, you know, he was, um, you know, breeze through and um, so we'll concentrate on exiles which is in the back section on the fifth floor and um, exiles was made in 1987 and um, this is Sunil very much thinking about um, his own experience his kind of specificity in a way of his experience as a gay Indian man in the West and he was quite curious about what what life is like for gay men in the in his hometown in New Delhi and um, it's a really, really gorgeous project in terms of how he uses the language. Um, the situation was very different uh, than, you know, a huge contrast to that out and proud of the West Village. This is him landing in, in India in 1987. So this section 377 of the penal code there still meant homosexuality was, was fully illegal. That's an old kind of colonial um, prohibition. Um, so very much not legal. A lot of gay men would be leading double lives. Cruising would happen in a way that was much more, you know, hidden than, than what we had seen in Christopher Street. And um, he went there, he was commissioned. There was an exhibition called The Body Politic at the gallery. So it was very much um, a, a commission in relation to this idea of kind of sexuality and representation of sexuality. And um, so Sunil went, he found willing participants. He very much wanted it to be documentary in the sense that he wanted real gay men in the photographs. However, he was also very certain that he didn't want to photograph people in any sort of a surreptitious way. So he would speak to people, get what he called volunteers, um, and then go and pose for photographs with those men. The volunteers, he, you know, also kind of become the informant in a way, because this is a city that he no longer knows in terms of how gay men operate, in terms of how cruising happens. So he's, you know, various cruising sites. And um, the text is another element. He went cruising with a tape recorder and started having conversations with people. And that's where you get these wonderful little snippets of language something here like the party is a particular favorite of mine. It says, we tried to organize a group, but it turned into a social event and eventually broke up because of petty jealousies. So just this idea of what it, what it means to try to be a gay man in, in, a, in a society that is very prohibitive. Um, so in terms, and I'll whiz through another few into the rest of the space. And so we then drop down to the fourth floor. Um, where we go kind of more from, let's say, the mid 80s up to almost 2010. Um, and one project here that we might talk about is from here to eternity. So um, Sunil received a diagnosis of um, HIV positive, positive in 95. This project's made in 99. So he's had a little bit of time um, between the diagnosis and is actually at, in this particular moment in time, he is ill with you know, there is an illness associated with the disease that he's very much kind of processing in a way in these photographs. So you have these uh, diptychs, which are self-portraits and, and portraits at various kind of vulnerable moments to do with his illness, whether it's drugs being administered or, you know, self-portraits. Um, and they're teamed with these closed frontages, facades of kind of gay, of gay sex clubs and, and bath houses. Uh, and then you have then this idea of who's being locked in, who's being locked out, and um, these places even in the daytime that are mostly frequented at night. Um, so that idea of also being locked in and locked out of, of healthcare in a way, of wellness. I think it's quite interesting to note that um, Sunil, you know, Sunil got his diagnosis, but despite being very well informed, there's a work that comes later in the show that was made in 1991 called Cock Crazy or Scared Stiff which was essentially a sort of an information film that Sunil made about, you know, proper use of condoms. So he very much was a very well-informed person. And um, so that also, I think this, this series really throws up that idea of, you know, the camera and the, the dark room, the, the format of the camera being a sort of a therapeutic process. And language comes into it very carefully as well. These um, captions that you can just about see there and, which is, you know, a single word and then the name of the club 
um, are, you know, adhered in a very sort of careful way. Um, and if we run on through, uh, sorry. so we've also got text used, the text, you know, uh, in this piece shroud here where he's, you know, it's almost like a funereal scene. So it's, it's a low personal, you know, moment in relation to the illness. And, and I think we may speak later about that, that, that sort of sense in all of Sunil's work that the, the personal and the intimate is very much a central part and not to be ignored or that idea of the person, the, you know, um, intimacy in a way being very much part of his practice. Um, country portrait here, we were, were able to include a very beautiful, this is a family focused uh, project about his homeland, a very touching letter to his father included there. Um, Sun City at the back of his face um, is a very powerful work that he made in 2010. Um, it was a commission by the Pompidou and it was a kind of a big production in many ways. And um, it's based on the 1962 film La Jete, uh, which Sunil and, and many, many students of film and photography would have studied. Um, the film itself is a series of stills. The entire movement of the film is simply moving through still images. Um, and Sunil wants to make his own version of this in a way, but maybe perhaps making the stills for the film that doesn't exist. And there's, it's kind of a dual narrative going on. You have, you know, a kind of a, perhaps a newly arrived to Paris, um, you know, young Indian man, you know, immigrating all this way to find a lover. So you see there's a relationship, quite a respectful, romantic relationship going on in the daytime photographs. You know, the guy's very well dressed. He has a nice apartment. Um, you get the sense also maybe um, um, which barrier there. And then you also have this sort of subterranean secondary narrative of, you know, again, kind of um, bathhouses, sex clubs, where perhaps spoken language isn't as necessary. So the idea, I think, of text and language really does come through in an awful lot of the projects in the show. And um, that sort of subterranean um, existence, also the idea between the, the kind of tension, perhaps, between ideas of sort of respectful monogamous relationships and also um, you know, kind of a more sort of um, promiscuous desire, uh, perhaps. Um, as I say, it was a commission for the Pompidou. Um, and again, this is this is an actual bathhouse in Paris, and it has all this sort of Indiophile, strange sort of um, kitsch, almost Indian um, de decoration going on. Um, in La Jete, the original, um, there's a nuclear holocaust, and I think there's also perhaps a sense of some sort of impending um, health epidemic here maybe in place of that holocaust and um, also brilliantly he gained access to the um to the original jack the jetty that was used in the la jete film which you see repeated here in one of the earlier bathhouse scenes um, and maybe just keep if i keep going uh through this is the film that i mentioned earlier on when speaking about from here to eternity so the film that you see projected here um, is a kind of a wonderful piece that we were very excited to include. Um, so that's a quick whistle stop to floor, um, just a real run through the show. Um, what we're looking at here is a collection of um, ephemera. It was really quite important to, to, to Mark and ourselves that we had a chance within the show to really point to Sunil's practice as a curator, as a um, you know, as as a, as a curator, as a as a as a maker of and um, kind of you know a collaborator and somebody. So all of his his sort of activism and then exhibition generation and and is sort of represented here. Um, Mark, maybe we'll start to talk more. That's hopefully it just gives everyone a quick some quick visual access to the show if you haven't managed to visit us or may perhaps won't be able to. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> thanks. Thanks, guy. I was I was beginning to relax. <laughs> it was good <laughs> taking us through a tour. Um, I mean, where to begin? I mean, Sunil really. Um, I mean, he's. Why do a retrospective is the question, isn't it? Really, when and, and what for and what purpose does, does it serve? And I think really someone like for me, Sunil. It's been, as I said in the text for the book, I mean, I think we've been in conversation for about 30 years and oh, it's wonderful. shocking to see how time, how time does its work. I mean, obviously Sunil is, therefore this, the arc of his work 
has been very close to the organization of autograph anyway and he's part of the dna literally part of the dna of uh, of, of, of autographs formation and i think that's very important to state along with other people of course but you know, his 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 sense of his sense i think the key word you said there which resonates for me is the idea of making he's always been someone that has been at the forefront of making, making organizations, making change, making political action, kind of making, making a difference. Making space also, even. Pardon? Making space. Making space and also making himself visible and the politics mm -hmm. of his life visible. Incredibly inclusive and always very, with the relationship with his, his mother, Penny, I think is, is, is essential to his, his, his sense of being, you know, conflicted there as a son in many ways, you know, disappointing. And at the same time, kind of approved. I love the kind of uh, the amb the ambiguous nature of you know not 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 wanting your son to be queer, but at the same time mm -hmm. always being there and being part of the family. The other thing about Sunil for me is that you know I, I when I spent time looking, having I think it's about four and a half years. The timeline goes back on this idea of the retrospective, but spending time, you know, just talking with Sunil, you realise that essentially. <clears throat> And I hope he doesn't mind me saying, but essentially this whole project of photography is about relationships. Mm -hmm. It's really about um, just trying to unpack a kind of journey, a journey into love and a journey into acceptance. And I think that happens really quite when, when you sit with all these different chapters within his work, whether it's the documentary work or whether it's the more kind of constructed you know, what one might say postmodern Bergen-esque influenced work, the idea that, you know, the, the um, you know, throwing away the documentary kind of trajectory within the work and looking at the way that text comes into play. They're very kind of, um, uh, I mean, they're, they're big statements that the works make, like exiles, you know, mm -hmm. Sun City, um, from here to eternity. They really are kind of, you know, I don't, I don't like using the word poetic, but I can't think of another word just now, but they really are kind of poetic calls for the relationships and laments to the relationships and for the relationships to be remembered. And they're kind of relationship, I mean, you know, he literally in many instances strips himself bare, not only physically, but also emotionally for us to kind of see. And, with, and, and for me, that's really quite unusual in many ways, because so much of photography is about you know, either fantasizing about something else or creating a kind of alter ego. But this isn't that, this is, this is really much about the reality of, of the day-to-day -day existence of living as a diasporic gay man who's, you know, has this Indian, Canadian, New York, you know, British experience, arrives in the UK at the kind of heart of Thatcherism, I mean, incredibly, I mean, we talk about um, hostile environments, but, you know, Britain in the 70s, Britain in, mm -hmm. in, in the 80s, Britain in the 90s, Britain in the noughties has been an incredibly hostile chapter for many of those people that feel as though that they've been marginalised. And, and from the wind rush going backwards, you know, Clause 28, poll tax riots, you know, photography itself seen as this kind of illegitimate child of the visual arts. Mm -hmm. Its acceptance only arrives in the mid-90s anyway. So there's an, there's an incredible wave of, if you like, of both mm -hmm. of, of activism throughout his work. And I think that's really what the journey round his kind of retrospective will give people. I think it's interesting that you were almost apologetic for using the word poetry there, and I really don't think you should be. I think language and Sunil's work, and also what this retrospective kind of allows you to do is also kind of really acknowledge how language changes over time. I mean, you know, the very idea of him, him being there at the very nascence of autograph, the association of black photographers, terms like black, terms like queer, how they change through the various projects of the show. I think, you know, it, it, it's a real, it was a real, you know, a, I, it, it makes you think about language within particular times and places and, and, and how that power has. And I, I love the fact that he often admits that he steals his titles from, whether it's from films or whether it's from books, but he's also a little bit, I think, in love with language language and that really comes comes through in how he works with text absolutely complete well I mean it's interesting just 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 working in the arts how you've been categorized from ethnic minority arts arts yeah. uh, ethnic minor, ethnic minority arts advisory boards 
doing research into yeah. the exactly doing research into the need yeah. for a, a formation of photograph photog black photographers and, and photographers from the South Asian continent. I mean, I think the labeling part part of it is really um, well self evident when you visit the show. Yeah. Just how language has been so fluid and slippery as mm -hmm. well. Just how it changes and how how it becomes nuanced. And in many ways, it's full circle. We, 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 people are questioning in this identity politics now more so than ever. I mean, it wasn't that long ago when, you know, well, you know, people that were running cultural institutions were seeing our work as irrelevant. And that is, you know, that has been mentioned to us a few times in terms of conversations. Aren't we over this identity politics place? And it's, and it's and clearly that's not the case. And I think more so now, people have been able to witness or, or, or experience the kind of shifting language terrain that people have had to navigate mm. through this identity politics field, this minefield is really, again, a, a, a rich scene that people can get out of Sinil's work, I think. But again, and again, you've touched on that idea of kind of, of it, you know, it is so powerful to have language for things, but it's also obviously so powerful to see yourself represented um, and that idea that, um, simply being seen, his his entire body of work in it, it can be looked in various ways as trying to create space and kind of visual representation for people who haven't been either visual in the art history canon, but also just visible in in everyday culture and visual culture, um, and that that idea that 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 in various different parts of the world at various times, you can be denied visibility because of your sexuality or because of your race or because of very you know. Um, and that 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 kind of quite simple thread through well, the show was so important. Karen, this is why I'm I'm obsessed with the idea of time and place and identity because we're not all in the same place at the same time. Mm -hmm. What's happening in India and what's happening yeah. in the UK in the 70s and 80s and what's happening in New York? It's very interesting, yeah. isn't it? Because part of what we discuss in the text of the book is that you know Christopher Street is possible in New York. But you come to London and it's just not there. Yeah. It's still very much underground. It's a very yeah. different scene. The idea that you have, you know, a, a promenading out community owning yeah. spaces in that way that Christopher Street did, which is why mm -hmm. I think that sequence is so fantastic because you can almost feel his desire. Yeah. Yeah, completely, completely. Like fancying is so a part of that. Yes, and I, I, each time I, I, each time, which is why I think having all sixty of the photographs uh, on display, or sixty of the photographs in the yeah. in the kind of chronology that we've done, made, you, you've almost we've made a, a high street which you can walk down yeah. and you know fancy fancy yeah. all these these objects these objects of desire are clearly are clearly uh, you know frame. Then you come back to London and he's which is why I think this London in the 80s yes. is really quite important because this is this is what London was. It was a kind of place, of, you know, the, the centre of it was essentially a shopping mall. Yeah. Places were pretty run down. People were getting on with that, but looking for this other, looking for this other way of being, looking for these desirable people, looking for this community was very yeah. difficult to find. And it was clearly very underground still. Why? Because it was harassed, it was policed, it was mm -hmm. difficult. And then coming into that space as a gay Indian man, he was, you know, oh, oh, <laughs> exoticized and, yeah. you know, in, in that space too. Incredibly complex narratives through, 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 through this work. But this particular, and so London 1982 hasn't been shown before. And I think it's so interesting that he was at the Royal College at the time. He just got access to colour processing. He was, you know, he really did intend on going out and making a Christopher Street in London, in, in you know, in, in, in Hammersmith and in and around Earl's Court, where he knew there was activity, but it simply didn't have that same visibility. So he had to photograph other things, you know, and that's that idea that, that just um, your presence, your space on the street, you know, wasn't possible. I, I could argue because, you, you know, I mean, obviously we've got, what is it here? Maybe 10 photographs here. I could argue that when you look through the portfolio of the London in the 80s, there's, it's this, what begins to catch his eye, what begins to become self-evident through his lens is clearly the migrant, you mm. know. So there's this sense of yeah. kind of finding the kind of other, yeah. other that he identifies with as well. But that idea of the migrant also and, and sort of the, the, the romantic and the kind of unapologetically personal, it was always relationships that have pr propelled him across, you know, seas and to new situations. It was always relationships that he, he always followed love to these other places. And that idea that 
the, the kind of the creation, his, his complicated relationship with his own family and, and this idea of creating, like how actually migration relates to your chosen family and how it relates to, you know, I mean, the, the video piece Penny that's included where his, his mom is visiting, you know, and these visits were very regular actually to be living away from your hometown and just the very kind of yeah, uh, migration, I think, is always there. He's always propelling himself forward through these loving relationships and making yeah, work Penny, about us. I mean, Sunil will talk about this when he, when he speaks, obviously, next week. But Penny was never far away. I, I, yeah. well, I mean, Penny always, always seemed to be there. Mm. It, it, you know, it, they're just there on the sofa or just yeah. with him at the private view. I mean, Penny was very much part of the entourage, very much part of the supporters club. And it was always funny that you had this incredibly radical, you know, political... Um, activist with his mum in the background it somehow wasn't cool right <laughs> but, but it was it was it was it, that was part of the radicality of it all and that was part of you know understanding what Sunil was about and you, you know I think um, you, by showing the film of Penny I think you know that relationship is obviously very special. Yeah. You know, obviously all of our mothers are very, are very special but having her in the gallery like that <clears throat> I, I didn't actually, you know, I turned up at the private view as well, seeing the video centre stage like that. And I thought that was a really good move to have her, you know, circled with all this work circled around her, kind of commenting on just the, the everyday. I thought it was incredible, really, in, to have her voice just quietly resonating in the back, felt as if that was right, that that was absolutely right for her. But, you know, I mean, I think you know, that, that, again, back to, you know, visits from Penny, the relationship part of it, unpacking that with a degree of sincerity, looking at looking at the multiplicity of, of, of one's identity, whether it's the kind of exiles project, whether it's kind of, you know, from here to eternity, which I think for, for I think for both, for my relationship with Sunil and the here to eternity mission, I think was a part of understanding that there was somebody, I think, that was kind of in crisis and I think sometimes it's a little bit like now, but on a kind of, there are many more artists in that place, but you know, the, 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 the diagnosis had a huge impact on, on Sunil. I know it did. And that the bravery of wanting to kind of, you know, put himself in the frame to expose the, the emotional side of, 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 of the impact of that, I thought was, uh, was, was, was very kind of, um, Again, just very charged, just very, just very real, very kind of, very, very of, of the moment, very mm -hmm. diary esque, and not in the same way that um, one would think about a kind of, uh, you know, a narcissistic way. It was like, this is what this is, and I'm going to show you what this is. I'm going to peel back the layers of how I'm, how I'm, how we are feeling, and we're going to work through that and try and make that visual. And I think that was very, very important for Sunil to get through. And I know that that commission from Autograph helped him get over that space, mm. which is why I'm so pleased we showed like the original works as yeah. well yeah. Within the show, as objects rather than reprinting them. I think it's also really important to think about the context of that, of the time that that was made. The idea that as a gay man, he'd have gone through, you know, recent years of full, full on media demonization of his community in relation to this virus. You know, so the, the, the again, that very kind of that very personal, um, the, you know, the idea that actually how the media would have been portraying and that's evident in the project itself. Um, <coughs> Absolutely. I mean, I think the, you know, people were dying left, right and centre. People were dropping like, like flies. Mm. People, they, pe pe people were struggling. It was an incredibly mm. fearful and deep. It was, a, it was a, again, as we said before, we talked about hostile environments mm -hmm. as a kind of key term. But I mean, it was incredibly hostile. Yeah. Environment. There was very little media empathy, very little sensitivity mm. around that. It was almost as if, there you go, this unnatural way of being, mm. let this plague run through these people. Mm. I mean, ridiculous hostile stuff from the press um, and amplified massively. And of course it was cool to be homophobic, you know, everyone thought, wow, great, that, this is, this mm -hmm. is it, license to, license to, you know, license to, license for disgusting behavior on many, on many mm -hmm. levels, both politically and, 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 and culturally, you know. Yeah. And we have, there is, there is evidence of that in the show, there's a piece called Memorials, which is, you know, absolutely about those, those violent, 
very those kind of hideous moments. Um, one is the Admiral Duncan um, uh, right. famous famous bombing um, and, and a horrific kind of situation, and, and, and a young young um, American student who'd been murdered horrifically through homophobic um, you know really really violent acts. So that is there are, is a somber moment in the show well, for that. And I think we have to part part of the reason why that's that work is in the show is because we have to remind people that mm. again it's, these are incredibly vulnerable. Yeah vulnerable kind of like communities, you know, very, very much so. And I think that idea that, um, you know, the book really is a, is a kind of complement to the show. Um, you've got, we have a page on the screen now and it's not a catalog to the exhibition. It's a kind of, it's again to amplify all of those relationships and all of those sensitivities and all of those kind of vulnerable uh, key people that have been through Sunil's life as well. Some of them of course have died now and we've all experienced death in our life, but you know, it's just to remind, it's just to remind us of just what the kind of context was. So you have these family photographs, and then you have these news, the things that he's kept, which again just show the uh, the impact or the attitudinal hostility towards people that were contracting AIDS at the time or HIV at the time. Incredible, um, incredible moment. So I think the book is a. Uh, is, a, is, is both pleasurable and both painful. It shows a kind of journey to try and be visible. And it's a kind of, and it shows a journey to what you were kind of working against, whether it's, you know, um, ridiculously archaic colonial acts in India, mm -hmm. or whether it's the, 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 the sense that people are trying to establish themselves as a group of people where they could share their experience. And I love this handmade poster on the left-hand side, the gay black group mm -hmm. for, you know, African, Asian, Caribbean, Chinese, and SE Asian, lesbians and gay people, you oh, know, really? people only. <laughs> I think it's just back down to that language. It's exact. people were trying to frame this kind of concept yeah. of, of, of how they were being other in many, in many ways. And but of course- The book just seems so full of action. You know, it's the action of them ripping things, these things out, but the action of, of con convening and discussing and, you know, marching and organizing. And it, it just seems like it's literally bursting with action. Every, every um, pamphlet or every, you know, kind of um, snippet or every, you know, it, it's, it's absolutely full of activity that, that, yeah. that, that this, this visibility that you need is not going to be handed to you, you know. Well, especially when you consider it now within a kind of pre-internet age, how things mm -hmm. were circulated, how information yeah. was passed around, how people turned up, mm -hmm. you know, and I think, uh, uh, again, talking about action and activity, we have to look at part of Sunil Gupta's formation through the politics of the GLC. Yeah, of course. I mean, I think what Ken Livingston and the what was happening on the South Bank at the time, literally a standoff with with uh, with Westminster, was a really important kind of uh, uh, political kind of framing. Really, there was the London was a radical place yeah. run by run run by you know left wing people who understood what it meant to put a free free gig on in the park mm -hmm. for people who understood what it meant to to um to fund small film groups to you know develop uh, photography small for all the kind of you know radio group you know carnival all the all these kind of wonderful things which were kind of coming out of uh, uh you know you know the, the, the glc it was and, and i think that what the glc did it remarkably was it got money into people's pockets very quickly it really it really did that and i think it was amazing just how uh, how what kind of grew out of that relatively small mm. uh, uh, funding pot so much so that of course you know the tories were determined to shut the glc down because it was just feeding this mm. left wing kind of voice which really made up london it felt like a republic <laughs> it really, it really did. It and also, just the, how the legacy of that is so strong. You know, it led to your. I mean, it, for example, this this exhibition that we're looking at the poster of led. You yeah. know, in no indirect way to a group of people at a grassroots level figuring out ways to get money, understanding the system, better understanding the system, getting access to make themselves space, yeah. and you know, to create something like photograph. Only people, whether it's uh, Zach Ovey, Ingrid Pollard you know, Armit Francis, Van Lee Burke, some of these people now are kind of celebrated household names in terms of the, in terms of the visual arts. I mean, Zach, of course, created the big show at Somerset House the other day, but they start here, right? Yeah. This is kind of like the small funding springboard that pushes some of these people mm -hmm. into existence. 
you know, same difference. I mean, the complexity of all the different voices just within that space. I mean, you know, Armit Front, um, I mean, wrote to me Fanny Curie, who was, of course, one of the early chairs of Autograph, Sue Trangmar. The people were also kind of intersectional in terms of their politics. People argued, people clashed, but there was a sense that you're on the left anyway, you're on the same side, but difference within that space why same difference is really important here. It was about it was about kind of using photography or using these exhibitions as kind of like, you know, political kind of levers within the space. It was, you know, I come into photography, not because I love the history of photography, not because I'm fascinated by the medium itself. I'm fascinated by the conversations that it was generating at the time, right? These were levers into spaces which you could begin to use the image as a place to kind of have a political conversation, mm -hmm. right? So I'm always interested, my journey, and I think Sunil maybe shares this, I think what we've always been interested in is not necessarily the essence of photography, although we love it to a degree, and it's very romantic in that space, you know, Lisa Madet, you know, mm -hmm. we know that stuff. But what we're interested in is the work the image is doing culture. And I think that's what Sunil's work is really about. He's been pushing the boundaries of understanding what it means to bring queer life into the public realm and then interrogate what that work does in culture. And he hasn't stayed in that place. He's moved on and the work has evolved in that space. And, it moved, and, it's, and, and, he's, and he's worked in these different kind of, you know, cosmopolitan contexts, Delhi, Montreal, Toronto, London, you know, and, they, and what he's done is he's kind of suited together, joined together, stitched together a kind of complex global map, if you like, of what it means to be an Asian, an, an Asian, Southeast Asian, you know, Indian diasporic displaced person who happens to fall in love and, you know, and, and, and be a queer man in, in all of those different time zones. And I think his, and I think what's great about the work you know, when we look at it kind of holistically, is that it has different meanings in all of these different contexts, because people are discovering the different chapters of his work in different times and in different locations and at different moments in their lives. And I guess that's why I wanted this book to be done the way that it's done, because it's a kind of, it's a kind of chronicle as well. We've done the show in a timeline, which is great, but the book's like a kind of chronicle, like a scrap, a scrapbook of all the little important things that it's really important for you to keep as an individual, to remind you of the journeys that went on. Because if we don't have these things as material culture, they get left out and they get forgotten and they get, you know, they get binned. So I'm really grateful to Sunil for keeping the stuff, mm. right? Because I've moved offices maybe a hundred thousand times in terms of the, the trajectory of autograph and the stuff that, I mean, I have to thank Renny Musai at times mm. for, for saying, Mark, don't throw that away. It's really important. It's like, oh God, I've got to move it again. You know, <laughs> Thank God Sunil never threw this stuff away because it's so easy to dump the important things, the important reference points, the invite cards, the kind of cultural memory, the relationships that we have as we go forward. You know, we, we somehow don't have time for it. And what I've enjoyed about working with Sunil over these last, say, four years in terms of thinking about this exhibition is that we've actually had just a little bit of time to think about what meaning these objects have. Yeah, and I just I also love the decision. You know, there is a Chris Booth book out there. There's a there's the queer book with Prestel. There are these yeah. books already that do the job. We don't need to repeat these things. This this book has a very different function and a very different energy, um, and and yeah, a much more perhaps active one uh, than an alternative route might have might have presented. Yeah, I mean, we wanted to kind of. Um... Um, I mean, we were influenced by, there was a Belgian publication which Sunil brought and also the newspapers that we've been, I mean, the newspapers that we've been producing, it's funny you just flipped into this. I mean, if we just go back one slide, yeah. I mean, I love, I, I, I love those kind of, um, um, uh, back to the autograph group. I mean, I love this one. There's, there's Monica Baker, mm -hmm. you know, there's Mill von der Bosch, there's George Sherry, there's Sunil, there's Michael Jess, there's Armit Francis, there's, you know, there, there are these characters. You know, uh, Lance Watson. Some of them, some of them, you know, moved on and did different things. But it's great that there's the the lawyer, <laughs> the solicitor, made that photograph and that he's kept it because that is a, a proper, you know, archival gem. It's at some point, and it means that you can look at these names and think, wow, where did they go? And who are, where are they now? George, of course, is a great mm -hmm. academic. Monica, Mo Mo Monica, you know, cu curator and activist, and you know, Mel went off into theatre and you know arm it went off into documentary practice blah 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 but you know it's great that you can just join again the trajectory of what, what the memory tropes that these things stir are really really important
And also so exciting for an entire, perhaps new generation, you know, yeah. and, you know, our, we're very lucky at the gallery. We have a very young audience, you know, yeah. the idea that people who will see this show won't have as long a history, you know, with, with, with Sunil's work as, as, a, as a lot of you and his peers do. It's really, really nice uh, to think about it, that idea of actually people encountering it from their own political current perspective. Yeah, and every time I look at this photograph, the one on the left, of this this man staring at you, it's like mm -hmm. I can't believe that someone could look that hard at you. Right? Yeah. It's incredible, right? So, <laughs> you know, and, and Sunil says to me, you know, in India people stare. People and I'm like, stare. wow. Yeah, it's like in India people stare, and it's just even that kind of conversation can can be extracted <laughs> out of this this type of work. You know, I mean, a static antibodies, fantastic work. Yeah. You know, again, you know, I just think that. Um, what does it do? It fills a gap, doesn't it? It gives you, it gives, th this book gives the opportunity for some people, if they're interested, to follow a path. Mm -hmm. And it will follow a path that is not necessarily that easy to find in, other, in, in the archive. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, and when artists collect their stuff, for whatever reason, I think some people just can't help it. You know, maybe, it, maybe it's part of, uh, part, yeah. of, part of what they do. But when they, when they collect their stuff and, and then they begin to share it over time, it can be, really really insightful into how they think as people anyway and, and i think this story you know yeah and, and celebrate it's so absolutely celebratory you know deborah willis you know and, and and monica on the train to newcastle in the train to newcastle the idea of an autographed t-shirt in egypt is hilarious you know it's 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 all it's 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 stuff mm -hmm. that i think kind of reminds you of just how important it is to be active to collect stuff to keep things as i say and i think uh, um, uh, he's, he, that is part of what he's about. Louise, I'm not sure how we're doing time-wise. You are okay. Maybe if you want to go through a couple of final mm -hmm. points before moving to questions and comments. Okay, cool. Just checking in. Um, no do you want to talk any more um, about kind of how maybe the the original sort of selection of the projects because there's obviously you know that, that original editing process I mean I think we've we've landed on about 16 in total in the show are there any those sort of itchy scratchy ones that you've walked around now and would would have quite liked to have landed you know because obviously there's more, more work than we, we've been able to show well, how mean, were those choices I mean I think obviously you start on you know killing a candy store really isn't it once you start looking at work you want everything I do anyway I want I always want the lot <clears throat> it's like uh, the hard part is once you start saying space is limited mm -hmm. and you can't, you know, we can't do every, you can't do everything. I mean, what is nice is actually is that you're not scrabbling around looking for things. It's break. What what happens curatorially is that it's breaking your heart when you're putting stuff out, mm -hmm. and it's it's also trying to. This was very particular this exhibition because it wasn't like we could go in and out of the space and think that looks great there or this could be there. I mean, what what you said at the very beginning is that we both knew the space very well. Um, we worked with you before. Um, there was a certain sense of of trust. I think you might that you 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 know that you and Anna could could you know work work the space really really well mm -hmm. and i think we had to i think the best part of that part part of the maturity of the project <laughs> is 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 you can let go and let other people make some decisions absolutely yeah. and i think that's really important and i think the only thing we really wanted to do it would have been nice to have more video work i think because mm -hmm. there's some great videos in in the place yeah. <clears throat> i think having christopher street as a full-on blown out experience it's fantastic. Having Sun City is a full on blown out experience. Seeing from here to eternity is a full on mm. blown out experience. I don't, I think we, we cut down, you know, friends and lovers and yeah. some of the London. I think the things that we cut actually um, are, are okay. And I think um, I'm very happy with the way that the show hangs together. It really does. I think the color, you, you muted my desire to, to make everything lime green and lime yellow, which yeah. was a good decision as well. <laughs> I think I would have gone much more 1970s. <laughs> because I love lime green fluorescent pink and, uh, and bright yellows and super reds but hey ho I think yeah. it, I think it would have been overly dominating so I was uh, again quietly um, um, surprised at just how how relaxed and you yeah. know what it, you know you just say easeful <clears throat> yeah. our relationship with Sunil your relationship with Sunil it felt mm -hmm. easeful and that can only be because there was trust which is great there, there, there is so many dark politics in this work actually 
-hmm. There is, you know, hostile Europe, there's hostile, yeah. you know, there, there's murder, there's death, there's, there's, there, there, there's HIV, there's media. There's so much brutality actually underpinning a lot of what Sunil has looked at. But in a funny kind of way, once you spend time in the show, there's a certain sense of kind of uh, affirmation and celebration, which rides out of that, despite all the darkness that's, that's in there, you know, having to photograph people in their relationships just to show that it's okay, that, the, yeah. that queer relationships can last a long time. But there's an affirmation yeah. in, in that space. To, to, to strip yourself naked and to photograph yourself in the mirror you know, while you're diagnosed with, with, with HIV is a kind of dark place to be emotionally, psychologically, but it's really affirming as well. And I think that that sense of, I've been using this word a lot lately, that sense of the, that care, that mm -hmm. someone like Sunil cared about the politics of the place is really what you come out with. And you, I would argue that you can't help but care about, about the kind of condition of you know existence and freedom and liberation and the right to be once you walk out of that show. Well, I'm not sure we can put a nicer final point to that part of the conversation than what you just said. So I might just shut up for a minute. And <laughs> see, I don't know, Louisa, time-wise, if that's an appropriate moment to maybe widen it out and take some questions. Um, no, that's perfect. Um, okay, let's. Do you want to keep the PowerPoint on screen? Oh, I can. I could come out however you uh, we, had, um, we had a question and comment from Dennis Lowe which I'll read because I think they're not working uh, so they comment about a profile piece in the Guardian today um, where publisher Margaret Busby, Busby sorry fumed that she was only ever being given black writers to read um, and in quotes the assumption is that it's got to be a black writer or a black subject or else I'm not qualified it's so limiting she writes Curatorially speaking, is there ever a suggestion that black and brown artists, photographers are similarly kettled into making work about black and brown subjects by university lecturers, galleries, and publishers? And if so, is this restriction of subject matter fair or ever indicative of genuine diversity? Wow. Um, it's in the take... group chat. Should I try and answer that? I is think that, you probably. Is that, is that, that's a really good question. I mean, I think, um, what is, I was going to say something there. What is, what does kind of freedom look like? What does kind of creative freedom look like? You know, and I think the, the problem is, is that often people are corralled into categories. You know, I know Margaret very well. I think uh, it's, it, it's tragic that that's, that, that you know, the, the arc of her, at this point in her career, as a brilliant kind of writer and scholar and historian herself that feels that she's just been given that, that kind of, you know, been corralled into that space. I mean, it's, I, I have complete empathy with that and I have complete understanding with that. I think it's very difficult for people to allow people to be, you know, to, to, to operate outside of the, of, the, of the conditions that people put on you rather than see what you can bring to the table. And I think that's really, really quite tragic in, in many instances. And I think this is where I think people have got to do an awful lot of unlearning around the things that they think they know about people. <laughs> so, and I think, there's, and I'm using that in a kind of, uh, in the context of a kind of, you know, decolonizing sense. You're gonna unlearn the crap that you've been given. If not, then we're gonna repeat all the same things that have gone before. And people, whether they're black, people of color, women, gay, will, will always be framed within the context of, which is not their making, right? I mean, I think the major, what, what people want is to be able to have parity and equality in terms of a creative life if they choose that path. Um, I mean, I definitely feel that way as a programmer myself, like when, you know, when you missed up and sometimes when I've asked and engaged with an artist to speak, on the notion of black identity, um, if they're a black artist, uh, and that rejection because I mean, creativity is so big, life is so big, and the restrictions that I impose on them because of the limitations of my own imagination and uh, perspective. You know, I'll, be, I'll be really honest with you. I've often said to, to the staff, one, one, of, one of the problems, sometimes I feel really unhappy that I've only been able to work in photography through the, through the lens of race most of the time. 
And that's that that's so that's such a sad thing to say. I, I've been very privileged as well to be able to work within the kind of autograph space. But you know, and of late, of course, people have been inviting you into the room to do other things. But you know, predominantly that, that's quite that's that's quite something, isn't it? Mm, definitely. Um, there's a second part actually to Dennis's question about um, the topic of race as well. And commenting that there are twice as many Asians in the UK as there are black people. Should work by Indian photographers therefore be a priority when reimagining what British photography is? When should be, when reimagining what, what, sorry? British photography. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think we have to, I think we are trying to reimagine what British photography is. I am anyway, I have mm -hmm. been for about 30 years. So I don't think we have to, I, I don't think you have to look too Heart. The one thing now is that, you know, there are some, I mean, there are people like, you know, Roy Meta doing really, really good work. There are people like, uh, you know, Super the Biz was doing really good work. P P Palomi Basau doing really good work. I think there is a, there is a reimagining. I'm hoping there's a reimagining going on. I'm hoping that the reimagining is, is, is part of a long arc of, you know, people looking outside of what Britishness is and trying to be more, more inclusive. I hope so, I really do hope so. I think there's some fantastic, you know, um, bodies of work being produced by people who are British photographers who are coming out of different kind of cultural contexts and helping us understand what Britishness is all about. I hope so. I'd be very surprised if we, I, I, I'd be, we, might be in this, we might be having this conversation in 30 years time. I think it, okay. might, it, it might be similar, but it won't be the same. I mean, I think the key word you use there is unlearning. You know, we have to acknowledge how um, narrow the space of photography has been for so long. And yet that's that's our inherited, you know, that's the space that we have, that we are moving away from. It's, it, 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 it can't be, you know, that ju just that idea that we have to unlearn the, inher you know, the, the, that, that the space simply wasn't given and, we, you know, from he here onwards in terms I mean, of how we program. I mean, but, you know, people, you know, power gives up very little, so you mm -hmm. have to fight for that. Yeah. You know, these are things which people like Rashini Kemper have been talking about for, for a very long time. You know, very important artist, she's teaching at Westminster, you know, I think her work is fantastic. And, you know, we, 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 we've supported Rashini's work over many years, but I think it's 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 when when people close their eyes and think about Black British photography, would Rashini Kempadu's name come up? You know, when they think about British photography, I mean, would 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 uh, uh, you know, it, it it becomes a kind of you know, maybe Christie Perkins and his kind of other his his kind of cultural background might just surface, but it becomes a very. I always ask people close their eyes and imagine what you, what, what comes to mind when you say when you say British photography. Yeah. <laughs> probably Don McCullen and people like that. Bert but Hardy. Also, there's, a, there's a very probably Don McCullen, which is he's a lovely guy. Bert Hardy. There's a very certain sense of what Brit, British Brit, British is. Uh, there's got these kind of unconscious protected characteristics around it. Yeah. <laughs> but also, I mean, you just you can't separate class. You can't separate who owned the cameras. You can't separate that. You know, you you have to also acknowledge and understand. The, you know, the, the complex and, and obviously, you know, no longer tolerate um, that, that, that um, massive dispar disparateness in terms of access to the industry, in terms of access to, you know, visibility that, that, that we can't, that, that yeah, we, we can only be as good as the industry and the community that surrounds us. And we all have that responsibility to make sure that that is. Uh, and I, do, I do think some, I do think some of our, I do think some of the cultural institutions are, you know, do need to probably unlearn quite a lot. Sure. It's interesting, you know, we, 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 we do a James Barner show, um, you know, 10 years ago, and James has a show coming up at the Serpentine Gallery very, very soon. And, and, I, and I think the danger is, is that the work that we did with James gets erased in that conversation. Yeah. So there's been an awful lot of heavy lifting trying to get people like James in, in, into, the, into the ground. And I think a lot of it is scholarship as well, but a lot of it is curating. A lot of it is, is uh, you know, is allowing those kind of curatorial voices to have a kind of platform too. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, in terms of scholarship, I think, you know, the academy has to teach this work too. And if there aren't any 
black professors yeah. in the photography departments, then the work gets left out of the story. And if there isn't anybody calling that to 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 reference, then the thing goes goes full mm -hmm. circle. And if fee paying, if students have to pay, you know, ten grand a year yeah. to do a course, and there are no black British students working <laughs> in photography. Yeah. And then the, the you know the food the food chain is really quite it's easy to cut it off isn't it, it gets cauterized really quickly because yeah. it, it all comes down to this point of education. Yeah, and and you know we're we're not so you know within the visual arts and within the wider arts we're not so special. It's the same you know that 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 turn that negative turn towards mm -hmm. education being only available to those who have access to the, 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 you know, I mean, I know there's loans involved, but the simple, you know, the, the simple trajectory that it is getting harder and harder and harder, it is getting less, the, the access to those spaces of education is shutting down. Um, yeah, but we were talking in the 80s about, you know, opening up things, you know, Stuart, Stuart Hall would be talking about, you know, make, opening the pathways. We want the road open, we want the pathways open for, you know, young creative people from all kinds of different cultural backgrounds to be, to be seen, to be able to, to be encouraged to write about work, to be able to teach the work. You want, you want that. That's a rich place to be. Once you open up the pathway, then lots of people can come down it. But if you just keep on putting, you know, you know, economy roadblocks in the way, you know, if you keep on putting, you know, um, you keep on putting barriers in people's in way, then we're going to stay, it's going to be, it will be very difficult for people to break through. We're definitely seeing that right now with like, you know, more and more fixed term contracts and temporary employment universities who had made um, long commitments to unpacking and decolonizing the curriculum, thinking about who the makeup of their staff is, but we see those roles disappearing mm -hmm. and getting more and more vulnerable um, in the time that we're in right now. Yeah, again, you know, um, it's, 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 things get closed down very quickly. Very, 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 I mean, in many ways, part of the reason why I, I, I kind of in, I've stayed with Autograph the best part of 30 years is because it's been a constant challenge. It hasn't been something that's been, been given. It's been fought for really quite hard, you know, a constant battle for visibility to try and keep, try and keep publishing, try and keep, keep people like Sunil relevant because they are. You know, talking globally and working outside the UK and having conversations with other people because otherwise, if we were, if you know, things yeah. things would be more difficult for a whole constituency of practitioners if we weren't there. And if people then move off and go somewhere else, fantastic. And yeah. I hope they do often. That, that's part of the part of the package. In fact, we didn't even mention the fact that he's such an influential teacher. Just while we're on, mm. I think it's the question for me is value you know, who, what gets value. And if you don't have people in institutions that value the work that people are doing, then they ain't gonna get anywhere. And, you know, the dip, what, what, what Karen will value and what I will value and Louisa, what you will value and what the audience will value are all, are all very different. But if we don't have a diversity of values in there, then it won't get over the line. Difference will not be shown. That's a very strong point. I'm gonna to have to move us along just because we have a few more comments, but definitely, I mean, I think it's really important what you were saying earlier about having different voices in the room and also trying to hold that place of like discomfort so we can talk through those differences. I think that contention can be really productive. Yeah. Uh, there was a question from Joe Henry about exhibition and future exhibitions uh, and what the time that we're in, in terms of the pandemic, what kind of impact that will have on works at our galleries and our respective places. Uh, will we carry on with some of the work that we've been doing right now? So example, Zoom talks, I imagine they're probably talking also about online exhibitions. So do you have any sense, I guess, uh, on behalf of like Autograph and of Karen, if you want to talk about where we work, about what this time might mean in terms of future practice? Karen, go ahead. Yeah. I don't rush through. Sure. I mean, we, we you know, in terms of sh the, the scheduling shock that we all had um, at the beginning of this process and, and, and finding new spaces for shows farther down the line. Um, but also just really acknowledging that, um, really acknowledging that the work that we have done that exists in terms of in terms of the networked image and in terms of our colleagues who work in the digital department who are kind of really, you know, integrating that, that thinking much more into how we work, thinking about what a building means, thinking about 
um, what physical, what communing together means, you know, for, for the best will in the world and every sort of Zoom conference as possible, you know, we didn't want to open the show without being able, allowing Sunil to kind of celebrate and bask in the sociability of, you know, um, people who care about um, the image and his work coming together in a buzzy room. We weren't able to do that. In terms of kind of programming, I really honestly think it's probably too soon to proffer some sort of, you know, um, clear vision for the future. We're still, as an organization, figuring out what this means for us and um, figuring out what it means for audiences and how they use and what, what they expect. And um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's very much sort of still being, still being written and with you know, in conversation with, with, you know, colleagues like yourself, Louise, of what we've been able to offer very quickly and adapt to very quickly in terms of offering, um, yes, mm -hmm. ways, ways into the, to the kind of what we're doing here, you know, from, from your home and from other people's home and from, you know, strip lit offices instead of us all being in physical space together. It's, it's been an adjustment, but I mean, your situation's very different institutionally, Mark. Yeah, I mean, we are, um, I mean, we, 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 I mean, I think the term agency is, is comes to mind very, you know, kind of what I, I think we were an agent, we were very much an agency before. We have a building which we try to be as hospitable as we can in, I think that has obviously changed. Um, we're asking very different, we're asking very big questions about, you know, what, what that space is now. And I think um, we do know that it's not what it was. <laughs> and we do know, I do feel as though it would be a huge mistake to try and make it what it was. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what does the future look like? We don't really know, but we certainly know that it's gonna be very different. And as part of our agency, I think, we have to make sure that we do the thing that we were intending to do, which is mm -hmm. to try and support artists and communicate a very particular mission. Yeah. You know, the, the race rights representation mission is still very much at the heart of what we'll be doing. And if we can, you know, support people through the helping them through the economy of their lives in terms of making and publishing, I think book is great. We had a, we had a, a Lena Iris Victor's book published the other day and it sold out over a weekend. The biggest, <laughs> problem, the biggest problem we had was trying to, <laughs> trying to realize that we didn't really have the uh, infrastructure to pack up so many books <laughs> and send them out. So that you know, so that that's fantastic news. That, that we're just looking. It's it's a bit like a climate, isn't it? You're just looking at the climate and seeing what's changing and trying to make sure that you've got the right tools. I think that says to me that there's a, a huge hunger out there for people to get material objects into their hands and to see things. So I think you know publishing might be might be might 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 be more than that space. I don't, I really don't know. But also just the reassurance that we were through this through this very Big insane question. locked in time. People were hungry for culture. People accessed our programs regardless of whether our door was open or not. And that that is is a very heartening thing. You know the idea that actually access to the visual arts and you know storytelling were such a crucial part of how many people actually got through this period of time and what can we learn from acknowledging that and thinking about that as an organization no that's a good point i mean from my <laughs> did mark cut i'm not sure if mark's frozen actually i don't see him in the call anymore i'll keep an eye out on him okay. um from my point of view though, I mean, I do want things to change. I think the way that the culture sector was working, visual arts had been operating, the output was really high. Um, the hierarchies that exist that continue to oppress. I mean, we've been talking a lot about race, mm -hmm. class. Um, oh, good, you came back. Um, I do want it to change and it's heartening to see that change here. Um, and also to reach people who are in different areas. Um, sorry. We just keep getting messages. I think we have time for one more um, message. Um, okay, um, sorry, someone just sent through a link. Binti, could you send it to the TPG address, please, so that I can share it through the chat function? Thank you. Um, we have one more comment uh, just about um, the sense of otherness in Sunil's work 
thinking about uh, queer, being a person of color, Indian Canadian, working class, and how that's influenced his work. I know you've both spoken quite a bit about that, but is there anything else that you want to say apart from the subjects that he's chosen to represent? Does that make sense a bit? Sorry. Yeah, we can. Well, I mean, I think again, you know, there's a there is a there's a there's a full arc of complexity around Sunil's journey. Really, can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Thank you. Good. Sorry. There's a. I, I actually I crashed out and somehow got back in. I, I didn't let you in. <laughs> but um, there's a there's a full arc of complexity around work, which I think. You know, I mean, his father been a service, you know, military person. You know, him been in the him been in the military. Him wanting to be, you know, pushed. You know, it's a it's a full art, really. It's all I can really say. I think, and that's great that he's able to, again through the show to share that space. I think it's really important. And just that idea, also the idea of of an outsider in any way. You know, the the need mm -hmm. and the, the very basics of the need to to connect and to relate. And um, I think is is ever present in the work. Um, and, and those two things are certainly, those ideas are certainly linked. Great. Um, do you have any final comments, anyone, before we wrap up today? <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to manage the tech and things too. No, no, I'm, I'm, if you're good, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, me too. I would just like to um, say, though, can I just say something? I would like to thank, you know, um, um, and Bagri and everyone who's kind of you know rallied around, especially at this point in time, to, to around the project. And I'd also like to thank Neil as well for his incredible generosity and you know sharing 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 his, his work in that way. He's been fantastic to work with, and it was just it was a shame in many ways that the space was not a private view the way we're used to it. But on reflection, I quite enjoyed the. the, the, the you know the, the the socially distant day that we had. It actually reminded me that you could actually have conversations with people for longer sure. than two minutes, <laughs> drifting around the room with a glass of wine in your hand. So the conversations that we had on that day and the, and the fact that we were just around this table and people were dropping in and out, it felt like a domestic environment sure. in many ways, which was really quite, quite, quite something because those that kind of journey to the, the day's opening were those that were people, were, were ex-lovers, were old friends, the yeah. people that were committed to the artist. So that felt like a very... Although the numbers were, were, were low than what we used to around around the room, it felt like a very special kind of uh, conversation. So I, I actually thought that that was one of the differences that should be celebrated. Well, that's lovely of you to say. Well, um, thank you both really for putting on a beautiful show. And obviously, of course, to Anna Daniman and Karen Mark, thank you for your rich conversation tonight. It was really great to hear more about the exhibition and to get a better sense of Sunil's work, especially for those who aren't in London. But if you are in London or can access it, it is open until January. There's information on our website. Um, and really thank you to our participants for your ongoing commitment to the gallery. We really wouldn't be able to do what we do without you. So thank you. Um, if you have a moment, there's a quick poll at the end. I always feel a bit sheepish mentioning this and I'm gonna stop at some point in lockdown making a joke about this but if you have a moment please fill out our poll anyway i hope you're all okay and i hope you'll also be able to join us next week when we have sunil gupta himself who will be in conversation with mason lover yap and please keep checking our website for more information on future program and for information on how to visit the gallery thank you all um, again soon and thank you karen and mark one more time thank you louisa and thank you louisa. We'll thank you, all karen. Thank thanks everyone I'll be in touch with you. Okay. And here's the poll.